water, a transparent, odorless, tasteless substance that covers over 70% of our planet's surface. A compound that acts as the foundational liquid for all known forms of life. But as basic as it appears to be, water is a versatile liquid. It can be a serene, peaceful thing, or an unstoppable and destructive force. Bruce Lee famously said, Now water can flow, or it can crash. Be water, my friend. And I would really say the entire human experience has been shaped over thousands and thousands of years by water. Our proximity to it and intrinsic biological dependence on it has given water immeasurable, deep-rooted significance in our collective human DNA. From agriculture, transportation, and medicine, to art, entertainment, religion, myth, to say water is important is downright goofy. It's redundant, because we are water. So then it's no surprise that many forms of human expression explore, use, represent, feature, or comment on water itself. Books, paintings, plays, movies, poetry, and much, much more recently, video games. Oh yeah, baby. Now this may sound obvious to you. Like, yeah, all right, there's water everywhere and in anything. Who cares? What's special about some virtual water? Well, video games, in my humble opinion at least, have the potential to be the pinnacle of human creativity. Key word there is uh, potential. Nearly every art form known to man rolled up into one virtual world, an immersive and interactive experience for you to see, hear, and explore. So naturally, water here too can be a little bit special, mostly because it can be so many different things, look so many different ways, and have a multitude of functions or levels of interactivity. In some games, water has a starring role in the story or themes, and in others it is simply scenery, pretty, refreshing, and cool. But water also can be wielded as a tool of horror and action, perhaps used as a weapon itself or ingredient to craft other items and potions within a specific game. You truly can think of water as like one of those foundational lumps of world-building clay. The game designer is the artist, and it is up to them to morph and utilize it in any way they see fit. But before we go any further with what I'm talking about here, I want to know, right now in the comments, what's the first thing that came to mind for you when you saw the title of this here video? Was it a specific game? A zone, a song, character, item, maybe an absolute booty cheeks level. Well, regardless of what it was, I want to welcome you personally to this video about water and video games, and I'm very excited to share my psychotic ramblings with you on this subject. Okay, lastly, before we get started, I want to thank all of my incredible patrons for supporting me away from YouTube. It really, really does help me out a ton personally, so thank you, each one of you. I am Ghost, your host as always, and without any further ado, let's quite literally dive in. Well, for me personally, the very first thing that comes to mind when I think of water in video games is graphics. Graphical fidelity has long been one of the constant tracks of innovation in the video game industry. I would say it has historically maybe been number one for most game companies. A way to always be wowing the public with how real their new game looks on modern hardware, and dating back to the earliest days of gaming to now, water has always been one of the main tools of flexing the newest tech. And this gives you an example of the overwhelming performance of PlayStation 3. And this really makes a ton of sense when you think about it. Making convincing looking video game water could theoretically require any combination of animation, lighting, textures, physics, color, and whatever other tricks you employ to try to make the stuff look good. Some out there are particularly passionate about their water looking as photorealistic as possible, like this guy right here. He is a total legend on the Wii U little social network. Honestly, I'm kind of on board with the movement. I understand the appeal. I remember the first time I tried to mod Minecraft really hard to make the water look very sexy. It was a strange, confusing, and beautiful experience that took far too many hours away from me and ended up crashing my game irreparably. Great times. But of course, over the years we have seen a sliding scale of water quality. Very early on, all we are really talking about is blue. You gotta look at that and use your imagination. But just a few years later, motion started becoming more of a possibility. And using just a little bit of color and basic animation, the eye could pretty easily be tricked 
to at least on a surface level buy that this is indeed H2O. Soon enough, developers were throwing in more effects like screen wavering, air bubbles, richer blue hues in the background. Like, check out the Donkey Kong Country series, man. You have some incredible 2D magic with really only a handful of things at work. I think especially in some of these early underwater levels like in the SNES era, there is gorgeous and timeless stuff that looks ethereal and honestly perfect even now. But when the 3D era arrived, a host of issues presented themselves for video game water. So many resources were going to the character models, the effects, the 3D level assets, it was very difficult to get something challenging like a liquid also up to snuff. Thus, more complex and creative methods were being devised constantly. Nearly every single developer of the era had to really hit the drawing board hard here. Games like Duke Nukem and Quake definitely paved the way with their rather flat but generously animated surfaces swirling around. They added in these sort of lens tints in the water and distance fog to really give the sense that you were in a different space and substance. You know, they say pressure breaks pipes, but it also makes diamonds, baby. And all the hurdles of early 3D graphics led to, honestly, a golden age of progress. The late 90s overall saw massive and rapid innovation. Look no further than a game like Wave Race 64. It utilized a very simple system of a small grid of triangles, a grid that acted as a physical surface that could be shaken by generated waves off the track with a really nice water animated texture sitting on top of that. But very cleverly, it only loaded the water directly around the player to save on system load, with the rest of the track completely flat until you arrive. This really gave the world possibly the most convincing and pretty 3D water to date way back in 1996, with all those realistic feeling bumps and waves. But as 3D graphics continued to evolve, reflections, more dynamic waves, and lighting were all being improved and added into the equation constantly. Echo the Dolphin, Defender of the Future was another landmark game with water graphics, but under a decade later, games like Crisis were coming out and really pushing the envelope, making honestly photorealistic graphics today back in 2008. I mean, I can't illustrate enough to some of my younger viewers how much this shit just blew people's minds back then. But those decades of crazy fast advancement have had a trickle-down effect, so the knowledge and hardware readily available now leads to a hefty majority of modern video game water to look pretty damn juicy if I do say so myself. So much so that when a big time title comes out and it's got some shitty water, that's front page news in the industry man, that's embarrassing. But I gotta say, my personal favorite video game water graphically to date is absolutely in Sea of Thieves. My god, I know I'm not alone in this. It just feels incredibly heavy and powerful and deep, but still catches light at the tips of each wave. It is gorgeous, it's realistic, it's stylized, and I would say it's perfect. But did you know that most of the water textures that exist in games period are often just a very simple illusion using normal maps? Normal mapping, if you don't know, is a method of texture mapping that gives something totally and utterly flat the illusion of depth. Scratches, grooves, nicks in wood, rocks on a path, it's just a way to up the detail and fidelity without adding any geometry to the game whatsoever. So for water, it really can be as simple as taking two normal maps and scrolling them in opposite directions, making the surface look as if it is swishing around. But that really is, literally, just the surface, because another huge key here is caustics, the lighting effect that occurs when you are actually looking into the water or in the water, giving that all-important crystally atmosphere atmospheric vibe that we all know and love. And then there's shit like vertex displacement so you can have big ass waves that really feel real. I mean, there is a ton that goes into this stuff. If you want a more comprehensive video on the tech involved, I'm going to link a few down below that I like because Lord knows I'm not a technical expert in anything on earth, but especially not video game development. And to further hammer home the importance of water graphics, just have a little look at the modding community of your favorite moddable game. Chances are, close to the top, you will see various improvements to the water. I really think it is deeply in our little human monkey brains to just enjoy looking at water, right? Just as people flock to beaches and waterfronts to think and appreciate natural beauty, it seems they attempt the very same thing in virtual spaces with virtual beauty. So I think we can all agree that it is a known fact of human existence that water is pretty. It's calming and cleansing, a crystalline liquid that evokes life, peace, and serenity. And while the stuff itself is surely sparkly and blue, I think when it comes to a video game specifically, really building an atmosphere, a true sense of place and feel, I think music does a majority of the heavy lifting. 
You could have a busted up ass game visually, but hey man, if the jams are transporting, I'm there baby, I'm all in. Video game music really has always been fascinating to me, especially when it comes to different biomes, climates you may visit within one game. In the desert, it might be like, in the forest, some little wood sounding hollow, the volcanoes are always kind of bombastic, like boom, 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 boom. And then there is the water. Oh my god. The way that game composers can capture the sound of an environment and then blend it up with the vibe, the pace of the game, and the graphical style, I mean, it is incredible to me. Amazing. And it's absolutely no secret, no debate whatsoever, that water levels and areas have the best music. Now, unfortunately, the copyright vultures of YouTube are constantly circling, hating on your boy and demonetizing my videos, so I'm not gonna play you anything too risky here, but I do wanna try to squeeze in a couple snippets of my Water Music Hall of Fame, and I hope these are a little bit safer to play than any, like, Nintendo stuff. But so much of this stuff, even without knowing the context within the specific game or location in which it plays, has a certain aquatic and watery sound to it. So much so, you could pick it out of a lineup as the water song. So what is going on here? Well, game composers for years have been using various mixing and instrumentation techniques to make these pieces have a certain soft and muffled quality to them. I have always believed this is to mimic what the human ear can actually make out when we ourselves are underwater. More mid and low timbers without all of the fine details. This leads to a very round and soft sound. Also, of course, when we are swimming, things feel slow and smooth. Low gravity, if you will, so slowing down the tempo of the piece overall, along with that already subdued energy, can give a really wavy, pulsating, watery effect. But beyond just that technical stuff, steel drums, marimbas, flutes, and drones are all sounds that we as a species associate with beaches, tropical places, bodies of water, and the sun. I would even say most of this stuff has strong links to native oceanic and Caribbean people and their cultures. It seems over the years, global popular media has linked these things permanently. So when anyone hears those tones, the connection is automatic and immediate. There's probably also legit some roots in exoticism, where the far away and more colorful corners of the world have always been more attractive to us bums stuck in the northern hemisphere. But as I alluded to at the very top of the video, I never want to forget about the other side of the water coin either. The potential darkness, the isolation, the mystery, the danger. Because just as effectively the music and visuals can combine to create horrifyingly dark aquatic spaces, haunting tones and songs that are reminiscent of Lovecraftian deep sea creatures or other ancient horrors, I really believe that fear is an underrated aspect of video game water that's just not discussed nearly enough. Listen, I'm no betting man, but I would put down a hefty hunk of coin on the majority of all of you thinking about water levels when you saw the video topic today. And oh boy, you knew it was coming. I am talking about areas within games that are either covered or completely submerged in water. And I would say there are few things more frustrating, more despised, debated, and poured over in the landscape of video game design in the past 30 or so years. Sadly, they have a rather stinky reputation when it comes specifically to gameplay, which really is, let's be honest, the most important aspect to any video game experience. That is because this environment, of course, can uh, change things quite drastically for the player, especially in action games or platformers, because those are genres defined by player movement, and it is not uncommon for these levels and areas to in some way or another slow you down big time. I would say overall, game flow is 
something that is severely underrated when it comes to designing a cohesive experience. You know when you really want to replay a game that you love a lot, and then you remember that part? Well, I think in many cases, those more loathsome sections are just points where the flow got messed up by one thing or another. It could be grindy gameplay, long, boring story sections, or very possibly, a really poopy water level. No! Take for example, the very first Sonic on the Sega Genesis. A game literally built around nothing but going extremely fast, blazing through levels, collecting rings, and kicking Eggman's ass. It's a great game and an all-time classic for good reason, but a little over halfway through the experience, you will encounter the absolutely horrendous, smelly, labyrinth zone. My god, I hate it so much. It takes the primary thing you've been doing and says no. Now you move slow, you just jump slow, you die slow, and everything is going to be a horrible sickly green tint. It pretty much turns the game into a low gravity frustration simulator, and it is frankly unbearable. Or another great example that I think is underrated in its poopiness is found in Skies of Arcadia, a classic turn-based JRPG that really beautifully captures the spirit of adventure. I love this thing, man. But games in the genre are already known to at times being slow and grindy, especially when they feature random encounters. So when I hit the Mount Kazai area here in game, things somehow took a turn for the even slower. Walking around, underwater, in this game just feels like shit. You are so slow, and because your speed is going down, the encounter rate seems to double, triple, quadruple based on how much ground you're actually covering. Add in way too many puzzles and other water-themed stuff, it's old the moment you walk in, and it can be a total slog. And that relates, in a way, to possibly the most infamous water level that there is on the Earth. The Water Temple in the Ocarina of Time, a gimmicky horror house of hydration in an otherwise masterpiece of a game. This dungeon consists of raising and lowering water levels. But then you gotta throw on the big iron boots to sink to the bottom, take them off to float back up. The whole time you are moving at a snail's pace, my god. But in all fairness, there are some saving graces. You don't have a breath mechanic because you get the blue t-shirt that lets you breathe underwater. Uh, the environment is pretty cool. I don't hate how it looks. And you get to fight Dark Link, so I'll take those three things. But overall, I mean, this is by far the most hated section in possibly the most beloved game of all time. And I think that says something. Then don't even get me started on some of the older retro games that have water levels. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, I am looking at you, buddy. But I think beyond those like physical pacing issues that water levels can create, often just comes down to bad controls, right? Frustrating, unnatural, clunky, awkward, or floaty, no pun intended. Some games try to make swimming this constant flowing thing, and in others, it's just a jittery nightmare. And then, how do you want to have your player swim below the surface? Do I hold a button down, or do I swing the forward or something? Oh my god. I will say though, my personal least favorite water level or area ever is Vashjir in World of Warcraft. Just absolutely abysmal experience through and through every second. Though it is quite pretty, I'll give it that. And I fully support anyone who enjoys it, but for me, it is literally like my claustrophobic nightmare where you can pull mobs on all sides without realizing it, the fucking seahorse. It just sucks. But wait, hold, hold on a goddamn second. Hit the brakes here on the negativity. Not all water levels are bad. In fact, I would say some of my most favorite areas in certain games are water-themed. And furthermore, I would argue that their reputation has been poisoned by a few bad apples. Okay, way more than a few. But when things are handled properly, these can be some of the most enchanting and enjoyable environments across all video games. When the developers can just keep the controls and the gimmicks reined in to be more in line with the rest of the game's design and flow, very, very special things can surely happen. I think the most obvious success for me in this regard is found in the Donkey Kong Country series, as I mentioned before. Literally, every single game here has, in my opinion, the best 2D water level gameplay and feel by, well, a country mile. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! These games just don't miss. From the early days of the series, it was the atmosphere, music, fluidity that was just perfection. Also, getting to ride a big-ass swordfish is cool. But in the more recent entries, like Tropical Freeze, my god, man, it's the only game I think I've ever played where I actively cannot wait to get back into the water. At times, it feels better and more responsive than the dry sections, which are also fantastic. And that is just because of how quick and smooth the gameplay here becomes. Donkey 
Donkey Kong. My beautiful son does exactly what I want him to do without fail. No funky gravity, no sluggishness whatsoever. It is just perfectly designed. Or by Nintendo extension, the famous Jolly Roger Bay in Mario 64. So here you are a bit slower and the game flow could theoretically be disrupted, but along with the rest of the majesty that is this game, it works so wonderfully. A sense of space and freedom, exploration, but also some of that darkness and mystery. If anything, it stands out as one of the strongest worlds. It seems to me Nintendo has a much higher success rate with water levels than pretty much every other company out there. But I also want to highlight a pretty underrated water level that I never see people talk about on the internet, and it is from the platformer Alice Madness Returns. This itself is a great game, and I highly recommend it to pretty much everyone, but there's an area known as the Diluted Depths. Just incredible atmosphere, implementation of the aquatic life and themes married in with like the Alice in Wonderland psychedelic stuff, great gameplay, it's fantastic. And maybe my favorite individual water level ever is in Shadow of the Colossus, the Seventh Colossus, a giant sea serpent-like beast that acts pretty much as the entire level itself. You are in and out of the water, finding its weak point on its back. Just the sense of movement, scale, and danger is all thanks, in my opinion, to the water and this life that it harbors. It's damn near perfect. But right there with it is also the fishing hamlet in Bloodborne. Some people hate it, but I think it's just because they stink at the game and they can't beat the big street sharks. Wonderful and specific atmosphere is captured here. Everything feels waterlogged, barnacled over, and moist. You know, it's funny, I think a lot of the games that seem to get these levels or areas right, they just allow water to be a complement to the gameplay. A new lens for you to see the world through, and the underwater sections that work best use the water to liberate you, instead of slowing you down or restricting gameplay in any way. And there are tons of others, Sonic Colors, Rayman Legends, Twilight Princess, Banjo-Kazooie, Shovel Knight, Bayonetta. Honestly, now that it comes to it, I think of more that I love than any I hate. Now, hey listen, I totally recognize I've most been talking about platformers here, but water levels are literally everywhere. RTS, FPS, RPG, racing games like I mentioned Wave Race or even Hydro Thunder, Mario Kart, Diddy Kong Racing, puzzle games, point and click, you name it, there is likely a water level, area, or stage of some kind. And I think as long as video games are being produced for us to play, they will always be hit or miss, dreadful or pleasant. It seems more like a coin flip than any spectrum of quality to me anyway. But those, my friends, are simply the water levels. What about entire video games that take place in or around the water, where the narratives from simple to complex can be tied to it and the natural world? Now this is a whole other beast altogether, but I would say that these experiences do not suffer from the same pitfalls as individual stages or dungeons, and I find some of the best use of video game water is in this category. So honestly, the game that made me want to make this entire video is Final Fantasy X. Though it doesn't take place like fully in the ocean, it just feels like water the video game to me, and I think millions of other people. Back in the PS2 era, this game was an absolute visual treat. But for me especially, the cutscenes, man, the water in them just made me incredibly thirsty as a kid. It looks so clear and crystally, and the caustics are really enchanting. And then in-game, those themes are expanded. Everything feels so open, clean, and refreshing. No spoilers, of course, but water also plays a bit of a role as far as the main antagonist, the story, activities on the side, and whatnot. Legends say during development, they gave three keywords to every single person working on the project high and low to live and create by. Time, family, and water. And you can really feel how that affected every cell of development. Those aquatic themes and associations are so, so strong. I really think for so many people, video games act as their sole method of escapism, a way to forget daily life and stress, to relax and go on a little adventure. And there really is something just so inherently calming about the water. I don't know about you, but I find much more peace in something like Chrono Cross than I do a game set in a more craggy or kind of hostile region. And there's also this weird magical effect that I can't describe that nostalgia for these wet-ass games just also kind of hits different for some reason. Maybe it depends on where you grew up and what you find attachment to. And on the note of nostalgia, how can I not mention a game like Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker? 
which features a flooded land of Hyrule, the kingdom sealed away and preserved from evil. It is extremely tied to the ocean in the exact same way you feel it across every single aspect of the game. You get to boat around, ride the wind, explore tropical islands, port towns, and make friends with pirates. Oh man, pirates! The inhabitants of so many games that take place around the water, furthering those themes of freedom and opportunity on an unending horizon. I mean, dude, the water-themed games list could be super long. Mario Sunshine, Assassin's Creed Black Flag, Star Tropics, Contact, there are dozens if not hundreds more. But maybe the most interesting of them are the ones that actually take place almost completely below the surface. A recent release that stood out big time for me is Subnautica, as it combines survival action gameplay with like exploration on this alien planet's ocean and offers a shit ton of gameplay variation. At times it's relaxing and peaceful, and then others you're absolutely filling your diaper in fear, it's great. Abzu, the Endless Ocean games, Aquaria, Everblue, all of those titles take the challenge head on as far as like swimming and movement being the base of the entire experience. And they are all proof that when you simplify that shit, the gameplay and environment and exploration can really shine. But then oh my god, what about the games that take place underwater but in a structure of some sort? Soma, Barotrauma, Bioshock, these titles really utilize the claustrophobia and oppressive fear that water can bring. I'm talking true isolation on the sea floor, miles from sunlight, open air, or any help. This, my friends, is the perfect setting for horror. And if not not horror, danger at least, because although it is pretty, the ocean and even lakes and rivers can be absolute minefields of deadly marine life waiting in the depths for a snack that is conveniently human shaped. Man, I could go on listing random ass games, but it's honestly not really the point of this video. So let's move on to a few more, I guess you could say specific uses. So I want to know, what can water do in a more targeted way? How can it be used for a singular function? Now this of course could mean a few things, but I think maybe the most common is water being a boundary. And I think there's no feeling worse than seeing a body of water in a video game and thinking to yourself, sweet, let's see if I can swim, and then you can't. But hey, you gotta admit that water is possibly the most effective way to block off areas to players, or give a more natural feeling to the edge of the game map so you avoid any sort of invisible wall bullshit. And in this same vein, it can also act as a legit hazard, alligator infested or otherwise dangerous, an obstacle meant to instantly end your character's life upon contact. Some instances, it might as well be lava you're falling into. More of these characters need to take some damn swimming lessons, man. But boundaries, in some cases, are meant to be broken, and there are instances of water being something that you can traverse once you acquire a certain item or power. And this I like, it's a really nice way to give the player a feeling of unlocking a new aspect to the world and expanding their range of exploration as they progress. But there are also various tools of the aquatic nature, things we can harness and use for gameplay purposes. Now I know it's never explicitly called water, but the system of mana has always been closely tied to it, linked to the themes of life, power, and energy. So many games use systems of magic and elements, different sorts of damage, status effects, and spells. Now remember again the very wise words of Bruce Lee, and there are plenty of times in video game history you can dip into your well of weaponry and grab some high quality H2O strap. Something like the Elementalist class in Guild Wars 2 or even characters in like League of Legends or other MOBAs absolutely use water to kill people. But the one that really comes to mind here for me, honestly, is Pokemon, an entire type dedicated to water with dozens and dozens of water-themed creatures and moves. A few of those moves are utility-based, but surprisingly, the majority are simply meant to destroy your opponent. Hydro Pump is probably one of the most famous and most powerful moves in the history of the series. And Pokemon has done a vast amount of exploration of sea life and its design of these little buggers over the years. Sharks, fish, eels, starfish, and SpongeBob. Then there are the strengths and weaknesses in game. It's most effective against rock, fire, and ground, which all makes sense to me, I accept, but it gets slapped hard by electric and grass. Now electric, I'll give it to you. But grass? That always kind of was a head scratcher to me as a kid. Like, don't you need me to live, Mr. Plant? Don't bite the hand that feeds you. I can kill you if I decide to cut you off. 
and all of those elemental weaknesses and strengths definitely bleed over to dozens of other games. Then you get the countless number of sandboxy games that allow water to be like this object of experimentation and fun. This is most often where it is explored as far as physics, interactivity, and even science. I mean, god damn, man. I got completely overwhelmed while making this video realizing just how many different ways you could both thematically and practically use the damn stuff. It's staggering. Alright, so now I just want to chill out a little bit and talk about a few leftover examples that didn't totally fit into any of the other sections. Just some more video game water that I think is cool. And the first is in Amnesia Dark Descent, actually. A classic horror game at this point that has you bumbling around this dark castle, losing your damn mind, trying to solve puzzles and regain your memory while these monsters are chasing you down to kick your ass. Well, at a certain point, you reach the cellar archive section. Sounds spooky enough already, but the rooms and hallways are flooded, and you are encouraged to kind of hop on these floating boxes and pieces of debris to make your way through. That is, of course, when the monster appears, but completely invisible. All you have to go off is these trudging, splashing footsteps through the water. Let me tell you firsthand, it is a great way to build dread and tension. Complete silence being broken by quickening soggy steps behind you is absolutely enough to make you pee pee your pants. Cool water. Now next isn't a particular game, but another form of water altogether that we haven't talked about yet. Rain. Weather at large is a wonderful tool for furthering that atmosphere and mood, and over the years there have been some utterly fantastic rain systems put in place. Batman Arkham Knight really stands out for me, but so does Red Dead Redemption 2, and shocker, Cyberpunk 2077 actually has some phenomenal rain, I give you your flowers CD Projekt Red. But an absolute shocker, as far as the top tier in this regard, is Homefront the Revolution. Oh! I know, what is that? It's a pretty average to shitty game to be honest, but the rain is unmatched in the way that it speckles the ground really slowly before turning the entire surface wet. This was probably an obscene amount of extra work that no one needed to do, no one was expecting this, but it is awesome. And this game is nearly 7 years old. Cool water. Another thing I have neglected to mention to this point is sports games, and I guess more specifically, water sports. So we mentioned racing, but I'm also talking about fishing, surfing, swimming, or water skiing. This subgenre definitely has had a little bit of time in the sun as well, and there are a few gems definitely buried in there. Kelly Slater's Pro Surfer, made by the people who made the original Tony Hawk games, is actually a really, really good time, especially if you enjoy surfing. But I would say overall, these are often used as little mini games or side activities in larger things. Fish in MMOs, Mario Party minigames, you get the idea. Cool water. But you know, I'm feeling like I want to get really, really negative again really quick to balance things out here, so how about possibly the most atrocious video game I have ever played in my entire life to completion, full stop, Aquaman on the GameCube. I legitimately would not wish this experience on my worst enemy. It is, oh man, somehow everything is bad. Controls, level design, combat, hell, they even fucked up the music, which is inexcusable. It's the worst water game, worst water world, worst water, worst water man, worst everything. Throw it in the bin and burn the house down, then put the fire out with some better video game water. Really, really shit water. Okay, I'm calm. I'm good. And I think overall, I have made my point with this video. You can see how many different ways water has been used in the industry over the years. And please do remember that I am only ever scratching the surface. Contrary to what many people seem to think, I'm not a video game library. I'm in fact just one single dude, and I'm most often just drawing from my own experience when it comes to videos like this. But if there is a takeaway, a lesson, I think it's that water has a ton of power in our virtual spaces. It can enchant us with with its beauty, take us on wild thrill rides, heal our wounds, frustrate us with its sluggishness, and then make us fall back in love all over again with its ethereal and dreamy musical themes. Water is so closely tied to our human experience that eventually it becomes an afterthought, a given of these games and worlds. But I do think it serves us well to slow down every now and again to try to appreciate not only the crazy amount of work that goes into these things, but also the vast array of implementations across the history of this creative medium. So now I really, really want to hear from all of you guys. What are some of your favorite water graphics, levels, games, songs, and atmospheres? What are some cool, unique uses for video game water that I missed? How many times did I say water in this entire video? Let me know down below. 
You know, I usually wrap up with sort of a poetic conclusion that weaves everything really neatly together, but this time, I think we should all just chill right here a while. Until next time, everyone. Peace. Peace.